in the 31 years that I have been doing priestly ministry here at St. Joseph University Parish, I have celebrated around 550 weddings. Actually, that's incorrect, since the priest or deacon is not the celebrant of the wedding, but rather the couple celebrates the wedding and the minister is the witness to the wedding. So that's 31 years here, plus 18 previous years of priesthood in other parishes. So it would be good to guess that I'm closing in on being privileged to be part of some 800 weddings. The last wedding for 2021 was just a few weeks ago on December 17th, and the first one for 2022 will be on March 19th. In fact, I just met with that couple yesterday to complete their paperwork. When you're in a parish long enough, you may get to marry people whom you baptized, or even people whose parents' wedding you had. That has happened a few times. But in spite of the numbers, every marriage is unique, and every marriage is special. Now I mention all this because in today's gospel, we hear about Jesus, his mother, and his disciples attending a wedding. And it was a very special wedding, a wedding in Cana of Galilee. It is in this setting that Jesus performs the first of the seven, quote, signs that John includes in his gospel. John does not call them miracles, but uses the word sign. Interestingly, this first sign is not something dramatic like the calming of a storm on the lake or the healing of someone from blindness or leprosy or the raising of someone from the dead, but something almost mundane, prosaic, changing water into wine because the wine was running out. But before we get to the actual miracle or sign, we should recognize that one of the main images in the Bible is that of weddings. From the beginning to the end, nuptial imagery shines out from the pages of scripture. In the beginning, the story of creation reaches its crowning moment when God gives Adam and Eve to each other as husband and wife. And in the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the new Jerusalem is revealed as a bride coming down from heaven, adorned to meet her husband. Throughout the Bible, marriage is a symbol of the covenant relationship between God and his chosen people. Our first reading today from Isaiah follows this imagery. It says, as a young man marries a virgin, your builder shall marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall your God rejoice in you. But while the setting for today's gospel story is a wedding celebration, today's scriptures are replete with themes about beginnings, about abundance, about gifts, and about joy. We hear about the inauguration of Jesus' earthly ministry, and it seems from his conversation with Mary, his mother, that it was not exactly the time or place that he had in mind for his debut. The wedding feast was at risk as the wine was running out. This was a difficult situation for the young couple, and it may indicate that they came from poor families. To run short of wine at a wedding feast was certainly a serious problem particularly damaging to the reputation of the host and an ill omen for the newly married couple. Cana was an inconsequential village some eight miles northeast of Nazareth. The fact that Mary chooses to address this crisis indicates that perhaps she was related to the couple, otherwise she wouldn't have gotten involved. Mary calls on Jesus to use his gifts to help these poor people in their time of need. Like winemaking, a process that can be be an extended ordeal, John's account of this wedding feast is all about timing. When Mary told him that the wine had run out, Jesus said in reply, my hour has not yet come. Perhaps Jesus would have preferred plan A, but he moves smoothly into plan B. He steps in in exactly the right time and turns the water into wine. As usual with miracles, there is a human need and Jesus responds to that need. Now wine running out might seem rather trivial when compared to the needs of the sick and the lame. But when we look more closely at this story, we see that Jesus does not just meet the immediate need, but he meets it with extravagance, with abundance. 
You see here we have six what look like stone jars. If we fill these six large vessels here in this chapel with wine, John said they could hold between 120 and 180 gallons. That would be quite a party, wouldn't it? And not only was the wine abundant, but it was excellent, of even better quality than all that had already been consumed. When the waiter says, you have kept the good wine until now, John is really speaking about Jesus as the culmination of God's dealing with Israel and about Jesus with whom the new kingdom is beginning. St. Paul, in our second reading, writing to the ever-contentious Corinthians, explains how we as the church are called to use the gifts we have been given for the building up of this kingdom. In Corinth, individuals were flaunting their gifts, some saying they were better than others. They were a divided community, and their boasting about their charisms confirmed that division. In reply, Paul insisted on the origin of such gifts, namely God. God established this hierarchy, community first and individuals second. For Paul, private gifts are common property. Paul, writing to this bitterly divided community, stresses unity in Christ as the foundation of the kingdom. Shortly after the section we have just heard in our second reading today, Paul writes his great Hymn of Love, chapter 13, which is read so often at weddings today. I always remind couples, if they choose this passage, that Paul was not saying anything romantic, emotional, or sentimental about love, but rather, since the Corinthians were such a miserable lot who couldn't stand each other, Paul was telling them that true love is hard work. And that's what people getting married must commit themselves to, the work of love, which means forgiveness and understanding, patience, and a willingness to give the other another chance, and another chance after that and after that. Speaking of contemporary weddings, I would like to close our reflection with a couple of thoughts based on a song to which I often, to which I often quote at weddings by one of the most popular songwriters of the 20th and now 21st centuries, Paul Simon. You probably know many of his songs, but I'm sure many of you know, do not know this one that I want to quote. It's called Love and Hard Times, and it starts with these lines. God and his only son paid a courtesy call on earth one Sunday morning. Orange blossoms opened their fragrant lips. Songbirds sang from the tops of cottonwoods. Old folks wept for his love in these hard times. Now these are the lines that really fascinate me. Well, we gotta get going, said the restless Lord to the sun. There are galaxies yet to be born. Creation is never done. And that, my sisters and brothers, is it. God is always creating something new, and he charges us with being the agents of that creation, of that change. We have been chosen to change the world. Whatever our state in life, whether married, single, widowed, whatever our age, our ethnicity, our sexual orientation, God is gifting each one of us in our own way and sending us forth to make a difference, to help new galaxies be born. Isaiah told us how the devastated Israel was restored. John reported how water became wine. The same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God seeks to work in us and work through us today. Creation is never done.